Subcommittee will now come back to, to order. We thank you for your patience and understanding as uh, we had a vote on the floor. So uh, we will continue. I am going to recognize myself for five minutes and uh, we will go from there. Um, according to the records, the United States Government provides approximately $5 million uh, to Venezuela annually for democracy-related assistance. What, what is happening with that money? Uh, why do we give it and how do we monitor where it goes? Thank you for the question, Chairman. Um, the, the purpose of our democracy funding is to encourage the development of civil society uh, in order to ensure that uh, Venezuelan democracy be as robust and inclusive as possible. Uh, we, we've used a number of different tactics over, over time. This program has been in place since 2002 uh, and has averaged about $5 million a year. Uh, it has gone up and it has gone down. Uh, initially, uh, the, the democracy program was intended to encourage reconciliation in the wake of the 2002 coup. Uh, over time, uh, government, government affiliated, Chavez affiliated actors have refused to participate in, in, the, in these programs, which, which we regret because they are intended to be ecumenical in nature and demonstrate that is open to all politically balanced and in support of the process rather than any particular it, 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 The details of what is going on in that program and how that money is spent, is that something you can provide to the committee in, Absolutely. say, 30 days? Is that, would that be fair? Absolutely. More than enough time. Thank you. I would like to yield now to the gentleman from the floor, Mr. Mack, for the remainder of my time. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. And um, just uh, for the committee's um, knowledge, uh, my recommendation to the full committee is that that budget be zeroed out uh, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back to kind of the sentiment that um, Chavez will use this kind of struggle between the United States for his own benefit. Uh, and I've, I've been pretty consistent and on the other side of this feeling. So what we have in Hugo Chavez is a classic bully. So he, he tries to get people to do things based upon fear of what he might do. Uh, and I, I think it's, this is an important point that we, instead of looking at what it is that we are fearful that Chavez might do, we ought to look at what is the right thing to do for national security, what is the right thing to do for uh, the people of this country, uh, and what is the right thing to do for our friends in Latin America and around the world, not because of threats from a bully. Um, so I hope that, uh, yeah, I would love to hear if you want to make comment on that, but let me, let me just add this one other piece to that. Um, we also, you also talked about that uh, we have had some great strides or some beginnings of some strides where there has been some extraditions from Venezuela to Colombia uh, of some drug kingpins. But the reality is that that is not due to the actions of the United States. That is due to the actions of the President of Colombia, Santos. Um, I will remind you of the MacLed case where we fell asleep at the switch. He was arrested on our warrant. Uh, when they arrested him, the Colombians asked if we wanted him, and we said we are not interested. Uh, and then they sent him to Venezuela. Uh, and that is why the extraditions are happening, not because of some great policy position or foreign policy by the U.S. government. If you care to react to those two statements, I would love to hear it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on, on, the, on the first point, I, I think that the reaction or potential reaction of Chavez with respect to the United States and trying to demonize the United States with respect to Colombia, with respect to the democratic opposition in Venezuela, are all matters that one can make analysis about. They are factors. I wouldn't say that any one is necessarily the determining factor. Uh, what we are looking for is results. Uh, in, in the case of the Sasada sanctions, for example, there is a very specific result that we want, and the sanctions were designed in order to achieve that result. Um, on the extraditions, actually, we are getting, and I don't want to overplay this because there is much more that Venezuela could do, but just in the last uh, since July 2010, we have gotten on the order of 10 uh, senior narcos who were deported directly to the United States, removed from Venezuela directly to the United States. Let me, let me, because my time is, in, and um, I am uh, going to go through it, because I, I just want to hammer this point home that Hugo Chavez, okay, I am going to do this anyways. Hugo Chavez, well, my time is running out. So, um, 
uh, I'll thank you, and I'll apparently we'll have another opportunity to speak with you again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from American Samoa, Mr. Falomir Vega. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, <clears throat> I do thank our witnesses for their testimony this morning. I just want to follow up on a couple of issues or questions that uh, uh, that were raised. At least I would like to raise at this point. Uh, uh, we we duly recognize, gentlemen, that you're just simply following what the statute, or at least what we did in the Congress, passed laws and statutes. You're just simply trying to enforce uh, these sanctions laws, or whether it be for economic reasons uh, or whatever. I uh, noted with interest that earlier Chairman Shab Shabin, uh, the subcommittee, had asked the question about the Venezuela's uh, oil supply, and I'm just curious for the record, what is the total dollar value? Uh, of oil that we import from Venezuela, to say just last year, or say in the period of the last five years, uh, Congressman, we uh, the figure I used earlier in my testimony was, or maybe I didn't, was uh, nine hundred thousand to one million barrels per day. I I would have to get back to you with a formal response and, and cost it out for you. Yeah, I, I would think it's important that we need to know. I mean. Uh, my next question for the record, how exactly, how many sanctions do we have against Venezuela at this point in time? You know, I notice that sanctions against individuals, sanctions against companies, sanctions against officials of the government, sanctions for terrorism, sanctions on nuclear transfer, or on nonproliferation. What is the total number of sanctions that we currently have against Venezuela? Um, well, we can go through them. There is uh, not fully cooperating on counterterrorism matters, which was imposed in, in May 2006. Uh, every year since uh, 2005, they have been found to have demonstrably failed in their international counter-narcotics obligations. Well, as I listen to your, your statements and everything, do I say maybe a count of nine or ten different sanctions that we put against Venezuela, small beady sanctions? And then there are sanctions against individuals. So it's it's a uh, when, when you net it all out, there are a number of sanctions that have been applied. To yeah, them. at least how many? Nine or ten? It'd be more specific. I'd appreciate it. Uh, some of these are broader sanctions. For example, the not fully cooperating on on terrorism implies other actions. For example, a uh, a ban on the sale of defense articles, or and and so is that as uh, do you count that as a single sanction then? That would be one sanction. Well, here's my whole point. Would the, would, the, would the gentleman yield for just I, a quick second? I'm glad to yield to. Thank you. On, on the question that you asked earlier, how much are we sending? It's approximately $117 million a day. And that includes the Citgo That's, oil company that, that we have. That is, that is what we are sending the pay to vase of the. The money that we are paying, the oil that we are getting from. $117 from million a day. You gentlemen agree to that figure, $117 million a day that we are paying Venezuela? Well, sir, it obviously goes up and down depending on the production levels <laughs> in Venezuela, the consumption levels of energy in Venezuela, and, and the market. Um, I, as I mentioned, I would be happy to give you a more formal reaction so, in writing. So I, I, and I, I thank the Chairman for, for that figure, because the point I want to make is that we are putting all these sanctions. And it is one zap, the fact that Venezuela has this whole bunch of oil that it exports to our country, and it makes it, does it make our sanctions look somewhat a uh, little what, oblivious to the idea that, so what, you put sanctions, but uh, we are still getting your money? Uh, does this make sanctions, our sanctions laws somewhat a little uh, if I may effective? Respond. The sanctions we are talking about are the sanctions directed against the government in Tehran. Now, of course, they capture Venezuelan activities in Tehran, I'm sorry, in, in Venezuela, because they have this active economic partnership. Um, but that's the focus of this particular sanction. So, um, no, I'm, I don't think it looks silly. I mean, by the same token, we've just sanctioned um, an Israeli company, a U.K. company, a, uh, a Singaporean company. Well, my, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that it makes it silly. My point is that the point of being effective. Have they been effective if we really wanted to do as part of our foreign policy towards uh, Hugo Chavez's regime and all that he's done supposedly contrary to our basic fundamental principles of democracy and all of this? Well, sir, I'll just speak to the Iran side. We look at the No, I'm not talking about Iran. I'm okay, talking about then, Venezuela. 
Okay, well, we continue to provide him, obviously, with the flow of revenue. Now, if a decision is taken to somehow create another mechanism that we would want to restrict that, um, or if he would, if PDVSA uh, continues to ship uh, But would you say that there is somewhat of a contradiction that we have here? We are putting a whole bunch of sanctions against Venezuela, and yet at the same time, we are paying Venezuela $117 million a day for its oil supply. Uh, and I am sorry my time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. We will now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Rivera, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman Cedas alluded uh, moments ago to the relationship or that nexus between Venezuela and, and Cuba. Um, I want to try to drill down a little bit more on that. I know we are going to have another round, so if we don't get through it all, I will continue on the next round. But for um, uh, Mr. Benjamin, you are the coordinator for counterterrorism. Department of State. How many countries are on the list, the U.S. State Department list of sponsors of state terrorism? Uh, currently on the list, uh, Iran, Syria, Cuba, and Sudan. So four countries. And with respect to Cuba, why is why is Cuba on that on that list? Uh, Cuba was put on the list, I believe, in 1982 because of its support, uh, pr principally for its support of uh, various terrorist and revolutionary movements uh, in, within the hemisphere. And I think it is important to underscore that, um, this, uh, that Cuba has not met the standard for rescission, which is to say that we need to be able to uh, either certify that there has been a fundamental change in leadership and the country has ceased to support uh, international terrorism, or that uh, the, uh, the the administration can certify that uh, that Cuba has um, gone s six months without support to uh, foreign terrorist organizations, and has given assurances that it will not support any uh, international terrorism in the future uh, because of its continued relationship with the FARC and the ELN. Uh, Cuba has failed to meet the, that standard. So Cuba has a relationship with the FARC, the ELN, both terrorist organizations. What about ETA? Uh, it is a good question, sir. I don't recall if there is any continued uh, relationship with ETA, but I can get back to you and confirm that. And what about any um, Middle East-based terrorist organizations, Hamas, Hezbollah? Uh, I am unaware of any fundraising activity or operational activity from either of those groups in Cuba. Um, uh, but I will double check to ensure that that is correct. Is, Cu is Cuba harboring any terrorists? Uh, Cuba has over time harbored uh, members of the FARC and the ELN, and pr I believe also ETA, although I don't, I don't know if they are currently doing so. You don't know if they are currently harboring ETA. ETA, but currently they are harboring FARC and ELN terrorists. They yes, they have. How about um, members of the FBI most wanted list? How many of those do we have in Cuba? Uh, frankly, sir, it's a, that's a, in the law enforcement channel, and I would have to get back to you on. on well, let that. me let me uh, refresh your memory. Does the name Janet Chusmard mean anything to you? Would you consider her a terrorist, sir? I'd have to get back to you. I'm not familiar enough with the case. You're not familiar with the Chusmard case? Uh, no, not sufficiently to give I'm, you. A, I'm, I'm going to yield for a moment to Congressman Cedas to perhaps give us a little bit of the background since this occurred in his home state. Thank you, Congressman. There is currently a $1 million bounty on Chesimar. She, uh, she was accused of uh, shooting a state police officer point blank on the highways of New Jersey. So that is the reason the state police has put a, a reward of $1 million. She has been in Cuba now for a number of years. Thank you, Congressman. Th thank you, Congressman. And I, and I believe that that was not just a random robbery against Trooper. It was politically motivated, and, and I think most people would consider that a, a terrorist act. Um, so I hope you will become a little more familiar with that case in, in particular. Um, what about um, narco traffickers in Cuba? I think some of my uh, uh, colleagues may have more to say on the narco-trafficking uh, issue. Um, Mr. Whitaker. 
Uh, yes. In, uh, as, as Ambassador Benjamin noted, um, there is evidence in the past that ELN and FARC uh, members having been present in Cuba. Um, there are continuing allegations of uh, Cuban government involvement in narco trafficking, but nothing that, that we have been able to, to act upon. And again, as, as Ambassador Benjamin noted, much of this is in law enforcement channels. I would note that uh, we have tried to reach out to the Cuban government and we have a, a Coast Guard attache who tries to work with the, the Cuban government in order to identify and interdict. Uh, well, before, and before my last few seconds, just let me say that in my next round I want to follow up on this because it seems as though we are placing sanctions on Venezuela, which is not on the terrorist list, but more recently we are lifting sanctions on Cuba, and I will get into that in the next round which is on the terrorist list and, in fact, is harboring um, a cop killer from this country. So I will go into that in the next round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I will now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. George, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I apologize. I was a little late getting back. So let me ask if you have addressed this. Uh, yesterday, have you spoken about the Venezuelan airline Conviasa uh, at this point? So the, my question is as follows. The U.S. announced that it is going to sanction Iran Air for its role in shipping sensitive technology and weapons. Conviasa routinely flies Caracas to Tehran. Uh, can you speak to the possibility of sanctioning that airline? And wouldn't it be possible as well to sanction any airline that flies in and out of Tehran if it can be linked to the shipping of sensitive technology and or weapons? I will give the preliminary answer, and then my colleagues may want to follow up. Uh, as a practical matter, we do not discuss designations in public because of the possibility of tipping potential uh, designees. Uh, regarding the hypothetical of whether others who are involved in supporting uh, Iranian efforts to uh, advance their uh, nuclear program, uh, it is certainly uh, um, Within the, within the scope of the legislation to do that, and we would certainly look hard at doing that. But again, uh, I will let those who deal with sanctions uh, and, uh, and the uh, Venezuelan case right. specifically yes. answer. But, and before they do, Mr. Ambassador, I, my point here is I would very much like to tip off, that is the point, it is the purpose of the question, I would like to tip off any airline that, that is engaged in transporting this sort of sensitive technology and or weapons into or out of Tehran, that they would be subject to these sanctions. That is what I am trying to confirm. I think that that is a well-known fact that those uh, that airlines and other businesses in support of that effort uh, can be sanctioned. Then, le then let me just move on to the sanctions uh, regime, uh, Mr. Dallaire. Your office, uh, your office commences and conducts all of the investigations of the companies uh, that that may be subject to sanctions. Uh, Mr. Deutsch, no, we, uh, we primarily work on the energy side of things. Right. And we under, work closely, of course, with, with uh, Mr. Zubin on uh, a variety of other things. But, uh, yeah. but, under, okay. but un, under, under SASADA, with yes. the focus on investments in the energy sector, those would be your investigations? Correct. Uh, how many people do you have in your office who are uh, conducting those investigations? At the present time, we have uh, four, plus support from uh, our legal staff and uh, the Intelligence and uh, Research Bureau. Four, four full-time employees. Um, call it three and a half. Three and a half full-time employees who, who are responsible for conducting the investigations to determine whether a company is sub, could be subject to sanctions under SASADA. That's correct. Uh, can you, I won't ask you whether that is a sufficient number, but I will ask whether you think the process whether it will be possible to exam how many let me do it this way uh, how many more investigations could be conducted at one time uh, how many how many can be conducted by one person let me start with that that's an interesting question as it as it now stands we have it divided by sectors and i have i think everyone in the office uh, doing a number of things simultaneously because various uh, Let's face it, a lot of media reports come in the door. They have to be evaluated. Uh, we then begin checking uh, trade press, embassies, uh, businesses, the intelligence community. So it is a constant uh, pushing things through a process with lots of, lots of things at different stages. So well, it is hard to answer let me that be, directly. Well, let me be a little more direct. Yeah. For, for those of us who have expressed frustration that 
the, the pace of the investigations, well, it is not even the pace. We are not sure the status of some of these investigations because we are not informed until, until the end. Uh, but the frustration that there doesn't seem, they don't seem to be moving quickly enough, uh, could that be addressed if you had additional investigators, if you had more than the three and a half people who are responsible for all investigations? I think that is a fair assessment. But let me also make two points in regard to that. The, um, the CISADA is a relatively new piece of legislation, even though it dates back to last July. Now, in, in the intervening period since then, we have set up a procedure that never existed before. It, we have been exceedingly careful to do due diligence on everything we have done. Hence, we probably have spent a little more time that as we get used to this, that would be necessary, double-checking facts. I, bring and I, Mr. Diller, I am sorry, I only have 10 seconds left. Let me just ask one last question. Uh, if companies were required to disclose in their filings made to the SEC, those companies that trade on, on uh, American stock exchanges, mm -hmm. whether they are doing business in Iran, that would be considered credible evidence and would immediately and, and should immediately subject them to the, the possibility of sanctions, correct? Seems like that might be so. And let me uh, let me get back to you more formally. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, now I'll start the second round by recognizing uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, uh, could you tell us again uh, you you uh, why Cuba was put on the state sponsor of terrorism list in um, eighty two? Cuba was put on the state sponsorship list for supporting foreign terrorist organizations engaged in uh, activities primarily in this hemisphere, but um, again, for uh, repeated acts of support of international terror. Okay. And then in, uh, in answering questions uh, from my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Rivera, uh, you outlined some of those ter terrorist activities. Uh, can you tell me what the difference is between Cuba and Venezuela? I think it is important to underscore that uh, the process of putting a state on the list and the process of taking another state off the list are two very different things. We have a very uh, high bar for taking countries off the list. We want to make sure that when we put countries on the list that we are not setting such a low threshold that we will uh, both um, uh, incur or create side effects that will undermine our efforts and our broader national security interests. Uh, as a result, um, the one Secretary of State after another has looked very carefully at a number of different countries over the years uh, for possible listing. Yeah, but I, what I, I, okay, uh, I, what I want to you said you gave us a definition of why Cuba was put on the state sponsor of terrorism list, which is exactly what Chavez is doing in Venezuela. So why is it that we, we have Cuba as a state sponsor of terror and not Venezuela? And, I'll, and, and it goes to this point, the inconsistencies that I think another member brought up. On one hand, we have restricted visas to people in Honduras who have fought for and defended their constitution, the rule of law, their freedom, and their country. On the other hand, there are people in, uh, in Venezuela who are not restricted, and they are supporting terrorist organizations. So how can Cuba, under your definition, be put on the state sponsor of terrorism list, and then Venezuela doing the same thing not be placed on the state sponsor of terrorism list? Uh, first of all, I am not um conversant with the uh, Honduran case. But let, let me just say, again, take, take my word for it. As, as I said, it, this is about effectiveness and about using the appropriate tools at the appropriate time to uh, elicit the correct response. When, when is the appropriate time? I think that is a matter that we have to evaluate on the basis of the activity going on. And I would say, sir, that as we, as we noted earlier, if the indicators are going in the right direction, it would seem not to be the right time. Uh, you mean the indicators that are being brought about because of another country's actions, not ours? We judge countries by the totality of their activity, and if other countries can elicit good behavior, then we certainly view that as a positive development. Well, 
Um, let me, it, I, I just want to, real quick, if you could put up the first, first slide. Technical difficulties. You're familiar with that, right? If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and looks like a duck, then it's a duck, right? Next slide. If it walks like a terrorist, talks like a terrorist, and acts like a terrorist, then it's a terrorist, and you recognize Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro, Reyes, uh, Raul Reyes, and uh, Ahmadinejad. We can, we can agree with that. Next slide. Hugo Chavez, quote, enough of the imperialist aggression. We must tell the world down with the U.S. empire. We have to bury imperialism this century. Isn't Hugo Chavez a sponsor of terror? As I said before, sir, Venezuela is engaged in activities that we find unacceptable, and we are engaged in a sustained effort to uh, uh, get them to stop those activities. And I think that we are taking the appropriate measured uh, approach to get them to stop those activities in a way that will produce results. Um, we may have differences over uh, the means to do it, but I believe that we are searching for the same goal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. We'll now recognize uh, Mr. Saris of New Jersey for five minutes. Can you talk a little bit about the arms buildup in Venezuela? I understand that they have brought considerable amount of weapons. Uh, that's, that's correct, sir. The principal uh, purchases that, uh, that Venezuela has made over the course of the last several years have been from Russia, and they include uh, high-performance jet aircraft Sukhois, uh, which have been delivered. They include uh, T-72 tanks, which have not been delivered, uh, air defense systems, and notably in excess of 100,000 uh, AKM, AK-47 uh, rifles. So there's, there's been a significant uh, arms purchase program uh, by the Venezuelan government. Some of these purchases uh, could probably be defined as uh, purchases to replace superannuated old antiquated equipment. Uh, you might, for example, say that with respect to the Sukhois. Uh, Venezuela had long been uh, a nation which purchased uh, U.S. jet aircraft. Um, we sold F-16s to Venezuela in the 1980s. Those aircraft are at the end of their service life, and Venezuelan government chose to replace them with Sukhois. Uh, so that, that's an example of replacing superannuated equipment. Uh, then, then you have examples of, of new capabilities, uh, and the T-72 tanks would be a, a new capability which traditionally Venezuela has not had. Isn't there also a factory that was built in Venezuela to make AK-47s or something like that? I heard read some point. Uh, Venezuela and Russia have signed a, a contract to uh, build such a factory that would produce AKM uh, uh, assault rifles. Uh, that factory is not presently in operation. Uh, th there's actually more that we could provide to you on this in, in a different setting. The reason I ask that is because I had conversations with members of other countries, and one of the countries that I had conversations with was Panama. And they have uh, found that uh, Venezuela has tried to influence the people in the interior of Panama, the farmers especially. Uh, so I'm concerned that maybe some of these arms are going to find their way through different countries in, in uh, South America. Do you have any concerns about that? It, it would be a significant concern if Venezuela were to, support, uh, were to start exporting weapons of war to other nations. Uh, I think that what we've seen principally over the course of, of the last several years is rather than exporting uh, munitions and, and weapons and things like that, is more trying to buy influence with, with money. Uh, that is that's the tactic that the Venezuelans have engaged in principally in, in Central America, in the Caribbean, in, in Bolivia, for example. Uh, there, is, there are limits to Venezuelan largesse. Uh, Venezuela, uh, as, a, as a matter of policy, has, has chosen to spread a lot of money into the population. And, this has meant less money available for, uh, uh, to support these foreign activities that they would engage in. Talking about money, how much do you think uh, Venezuela is sending to Cuba currently? 
the, the truth is we, we don't know the answer to that question. Publicly available information indicates that uh, 50,000 barrels of oil a day go to Venezuela, go to Cuba. Um, in addition, and that would be free or virtually free. Uh, Venezuela has agreed to uh, re-engineer, rebuild a refinery in, in Cuba. That activity has not been completed. Uh, and then finally, uh, Cuba apparently charges for the, the doctors and other experts that it provides who work in, in, in Venezuela, the numbers of which, I mean, they're estimates and we don't have precise figures, but the estimates are 30, 40,000 individuals, and there's a, there's a fee that the Cuban government charges per person to the Venezuelan government. The gentleman, you? Yes. I just want to know that you wanted to know, and from Chairman Mack's statement, that we buy $117 billion worth of oil a day from Cuba. By, limit, by my limited knowledge from of Venezuela, that, you mean? From Venezuela, I'm sorry. It's $42.7 billion worth of oil that we buy from Venezuela each year. That is my limited uh, knowledge of mathematics, but that is uh, not peanuts in my humble opinion. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Now that I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> uh, I just want to add that following up on my, uh, my friend, uh, Congressman Herrera, there are more than just one felon in Cuba that are currently, you know, just, it's not just Chesima, they are close to 100 that have escaped the United States and, and are in Cuba, basically, with sanction, with, with, you know, living there, enjoying the beach and everything else. Thank you. Do you have any comment about that? All I can tell you, sir, is that I actually uh, in the past worked on Cuba, and I can tell you this is, a, this is a regular topic of conversation we have with the Cubans, including with respect to Joanne Chesimard and, and other uh, felon, uh, fugitives from U.S. Justice. I can tell you that New Jersey State Troopers are not going to ever give up the request to have Chesima be expelled out of Cuba so she can be brought here to trial again. And we join them in that. Okay. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, isn't the only reason that they, we haven't put Venezuela on the uh, state uh, sponsor of terrorism list, isn't the only reason because we consume a lot of their oil? Is that, the, is that fair to say? You know, I, Chairman, I would associate myself with what Ambassador Benjamin said. It's, it's a, uh, we are trying to engage in substantial iterative sanctions designed to accomplish different ends. And there are a number of factors that go into this process, uh, in, including, uh, including the economic effects we talked about, including the effects on democratic development. So what, what other major economic effect is there other than oil? I mean, oil is a big one. We, we've cited the number several times. I mean, that, is, that is the administration's concern, right? Oh, we consume a lot of their oil. That is the only thing that is holding us back, isn't it? Again, Mr. Chairman, I, I, think, I think that it is broader than that. I, I think that that is a factor. I think that the economic relationship broadly stated, there are, there are dozens and dozens of U.S. companies that do business in, in Venezuela today, which, some of which are intimately involved in the, in the oil industry, provide oil support, uh, oil services, some of which are, are IO, international oil companies like Chevron some of which are, are like uh, Xerox, uh, American Airlines. And so these kinds of factors need to be taken into account as well. In addition to the effect on uh, democratic development within Venezuela, the diplomatic outreach that our neighbors have engaged in. Let, let, let me go to Mr. Subin there. Let, let's talk about this, all this money that does flow into. Wh where does that money go once it gets to? I mean, what, do we have any idea or sense of where these oil profits go once they get to once they get to Venezuela, I, I'm not does Treasury not track that at all? I mean, they we send them over a hundred million dollars a day. So what what what's happening with that with that money? I can't speak to Venezuelan government revenue allocation. Our office uh, focuses, but on it does go to their government. Activities. It does go to yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Does somebody else want to address that, Mr. Whitaker? Pay, pay, pay to bases receipts go directly. This is a change from the past. In the past, pay to base operated as a. Uh, it was government owned, but it operated as an independent entity with its own financial structure. One of the changes that Chavez made was to insist on pay to bases receipts going directly to the government. And so we, if your assertion is that pay to visa receipts go directly to the government, I think, I think that's accurate. Is this, the, uh, in comparison to other parts of their, their economy, what portion of the, their oil proceeds, uh, of, their, of their 
their economic input, what, how big is that in their economy? If you are talking about uh, government receipts, it is about half of government receipts. Uh, if you are talking about exports, it is the lion's share of, of, of exports. I mean, a very large, I can get you the precise number, but it is in excess of three quarters of the total uh, uh, receipts from exports. Okay. Very good. Yes. Uh, yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack. So half of the receipts to the government come from the oil that is sold here in the United, to the United States. Is that what you said? Half of government receipts come from uh, proceeds to PDVSA. Not all of PDVSA receipts come from the United States. Okay. The majority of exports by PDVSA go to the United States. Right. So, um, you know, it, it, I think what you are hearing from us is that we want to see some sanctions that affect uh, the oil uh, industry in Venezuela. And let's not make it, it's not an industry, it's, it's Chavez. Uh, right, right now, all of that oil, uh, we're funding his ability to continue to sponsor terror. Uh, and I, I think there's, again, I think a lot of us are wondering, and this is a, obviously a bipartisan uh, issue. I mean, everybody's talking about the same thing. We want to. Why aren't we putting these sanctions on Pedavesa, especially when the State Department, uh, the Secretary with the sign with the or signature of her pen, can allow the Keystone XL pipeline to to move through, move forward, which then we wouldn't need to buy the oil from Venezuela. And if we don't buy the oil from Venezuela, he cannot continue to sponsor terror. So why, I don't. It seems pretty simple. Maybe you can explain it. Why it's not that simple. I would hesitate to ever tell a congressman that it wasn't that simple, but it isn't. Go for it. <laughs> well, in fact, um, I fully appreciate your argument about alternate energy sources, and in fact, the oil sands project will probably take ten years to come online. Well, we but we get that yeah. argument all the time, and of isn't course. it true that there's been study after study already? Both all the times that the study comes back. Uh, uh, in, a, in a positive way, but then the environmentalists whip it all up again. I mean, we are going to continue to buy this oil from Chavez when we can get it from our friends in Canada. Well, that is very true, but we have to look at the market as it stands today. And we are in a very difficult economic patch, as you well know, sir. And, you you uh, can't look at the market in just today. It, well, I will even look at it for the next five years and say we have got to make adjustments, but in the meantime, we have to get that energy from somewhere. I guess uh, as I wrap up here, I just say that it, so there is a concerted effort to say we are okay with the terrorism as long as we keep the price of gas low down here. And that is the concern that I think a lot of us have. I think the administration is making a very concerted effort. We can go from half, three quarters of their, their revenue to, to Hugo Chavez. It is okay, even though they are participating in terrorism, as long as we keep that price of gas down at 7-Eleven. Now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Rivera. Thank you very much. Um, for Mr. Uh, Zubin, you are the Director of the Office of Foreign Assets Control, so you are in charge of regulating the, the Trading with the Enemies Act, is that correct? Yes. Um, Cuba is regulated under that Act? Yes. Our, our, our sanctions against Cuba were issued pursuant to the Trading with the Enemy Act. So Cuba is an enemy of the United States. The, the title of the statute that, that Congress passed is the Trading with the Enemy Act, and that is our authority under which we use these sanctions. So I would presume Cuba is considered an enemy of the United States. That is not for me to characterize, but uh, you are you're correct as to the title of the statute. How many flights um, were there between Iran and Venezuela? I heard one flight a week. That no longer exists. Is that correct? There, uh, what Mr. Whitaker had mentioned earlier was there had been a period of one flight a week, and we believe that's now stopped. How many flights are there between um, the United States and the other countries who are on the terrorist list? Direct flights: North Korea, you said Sudan and Iran. How many direct flights a day? I, I don't know, but I would be happy to look into that and get the, back. Do you not regulate? Those trading, trading with the enemy act, would that not fall under your purview? S sir, I can answer. There, yes. there are none. There are none. 
how many flights are there between the United States and our uh, enemy Cuba a day? I, uh, if you are talking about direct private, flights, private charter flights, are you talking airplanes, about airplanes that fly between the United States and Cuba daily? I don't know the answer to that. Do you not regulate? Yes, we do. And, and I would be happy to get the answer for you, but I don't know it offhand. You are the director of, the, of OFAC? Correct. You regulate the Trading with the Enemies Act. Flights between the United States and Cuba, an enemy, are regulated by you. Yes. The only flights that exist, according to the enemies list, North Korea, Sudan, and Iran is zero. Cuba is the only. You don't know how many flights. That's right. Okay. I'd like for you to get me that information. I would be happy to, Congressman. And I'd like to know not only how many flights, but who's chartering those flights. What companies own the airplanes that are chartering those flights? Are you familiar with that? Who who are chartering or what companies own the planes? What I can tell you is that to operate a charter service with respect to Cuba, you need to be licensed by our office. So there is an elaborate process in which travel service providers or charter service providers need to come in. They need to make all sorts of showings as to uh, exactly the questions you are talking about, their ownership. and So you should be intimately familiar with these flights. If I had a, a better memory? I could recite the names of all these charter companies for you offhand, but that is not something I Would you say the number is, is more than 10, less than 100, more than 1,000? As I said, Congressman, I don't know the number of, of flights a day okay. going to Cuba. Um, Mr. Whitaker, recently I, I, I understand that um, there was a, a um, summary that was produced of a phone conversation you had with um, the charge the affairs of Venezuela, Angelo Rivero Santos. Are you familiar with this? Did you recently have a, a phone conversation? I have spoken to him on the phone. I am not aware of any trends being published. Um, well, I received information of, of, of it being published where you did a few things. You congratulated him on the excellent diplomatic work done on the Honduran crisis. You invited him to meet with Secretary of State Valenzuela reassured him that Venezuela was well represented in the State Department and a desire to work together to improve relations. Does any of this sound it, familiar? It does not. Okay. That is not a conversation that I had, sir. No conversation between, between you and, and um, As I said, I have spoken uh, with Sergei Rivera on the phone. Recently? Uh, I, I would have to go back and check, but that is not what you just said is not a conversation that I have. What was the tenor of that conversation? Sir, I, I, I rarely speak with him. Uh, I did have a recent conversation. Uh, it was highly operational in nature, uh, and, and I would be happy to, to discuss that with you. But okay. the factors that you just mentioned were not part of that conversation. Were not part of that conversation, and they are not things that I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. If there are no further questions, we will uh, thank the witnesses for appearing here today. I would just implore you again in the future, and I would ask that the administration uh, work with us in, A, providing witnesses in a timely manner and providing testimony, uh, the written statements, 48 hours in advance so that we can do our jobs as well. I appreciate your patriotism, the, your commitment to our country, your, your, your sacrifice and your service to the country. I hope you did find that it wasn't too painful to come before this committee, uh, and, and perhaps we will have you here again. But we do appreciate your testimony here today. The committee will stand adjourned.